doing. We're very grateful to you. Uh, I'm going to uh, pray and then we'll read Psalm 25 together. Almighty God, we want to thank you that we gather in the presence of the one who said, I've come that they may have life and life to the full. Please persuade us in our hearts and minds now that true life is found in Jesus and in obedience to his word. And open uh, us up in mind and heart to receive your word and be changed by it, we pray in his precious name. Amen. Well, if you're in Psalm 25 with me on page 459, let me read to us of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Hope you want to keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline of where we're going on the back of the notice sheet, as there usually is. Um, the middle, I realize, is a slightly unusual place to start, but the, the big application of these this collection of 10 psalms that we're going to be looking at over the course of the summer comes right in the middle of it. It's structured as a big sandwich, as we'll see as we go. And the big lesson for us will come in Psalm 29. Might you flick over a page to page 461, and you'll see Psalm 29, verse 2. This is how we're to respond to all that we're going to learn of God over the next few months. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And then the psalm finishes. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And uh, you know how when you're jumping in the car and you're about to head somewhere new, you open up the sat-nav, you put in your destination. That is the, the destination, that middle bit of Psalm 29 <laughs> where we're heading this summer. We're going to be pointed again and again to the greatness and the goodness of God. And the place that God wants us to be is wanting to give him the glory and to worship him as he is due. But we start this morning in Psalm 25 with a psalm that one writer, Alec Matea, calls an A to Z for troubled times. Um, it's a good title for the psalm. I think it's troubled times because as so often in the psalms, David's having a, a bad time of it. As you glance down, you'll see verse 2. He's referring to his enemies. If you flick on to verse 16, he's lonely and afflicted. In 17, the troubles of his heart are enlarged. He's got many distresses. In 18, he's experiencing affliction and trouble. In 19, we're back to his 
hateful foes. We're, we're used to that in the Psalms. If you've ever read through them, there are five books in the Psalter. Book one goes from one to 41. And its big theme all the way through is confrontation. David is God's king, but he's embattled on every side. So troubled times. And Matthias calls it a, an A to Z because in the Hebrew, um, for what it's worth, with a, a couple of variations, each successive verse of the psalm starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet, hence A to Z. It suggests completeness. And that means that whether we're feeling anxious or broken or convicted or distraught or enslaved or fearful, this psalm is going to tell us what we need to know about God. Three things. First, takes us right to the heart of everything. The Lord forgives humble sinners. This is who God is. When he revealed himself to Moses back in Exodus, he described himself as the Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, one who forgives iniquity and sin. And what David does here is to, to plant his feet on what God has revealed about himself, and then he prays it back to him. So uh, imagine a parent who's made a promise to a child, maybe they're away on holiday for the summer, and they say, well, on Saturday, I'm going to buy you an ice cream. And uh, the child will remember that, obviously. Come Saturday, you'll get a knock on the door five in the morning, whatever it is, and it's Saturday. Remember what you said, today is the day you need to buy me an ice cream. And if they're a good parent, they will keep their word. So this is David with confidence. You've said that you are the Lord of faithfulness and love. So now please treat me in accordance with who you are. Uh, we see it first in verses 6 and 7. Verse 6, remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. They beam from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O oh Lord. You see the pattern is remember, remember not, and then remember. It's the only way that anyone could ever draw near to God. Saying, can the basis of the way that you relate to me be not what I am like, but what you are like, Lord? Merciful. And there's a beautiful picture of it in the structure of the, the verses, these six and seven. And verse seven is the first explicit mention of David's sins anywhere in the Psalms. But I love how it's surrounded by and embedded within and ultimately overcome by the mercy and the goodness of the Lord. David knows what I guess any one of us will know of ourselves, that our heart is not pure. He knows that he hasn't loved the Lord as God with all of his heart, mind, soul and strength. He knows he hasn't loved his neighbor as himself. He knows that if the Lord marked our transgressions, that none of us would be able to stand before him. And so he prays, please remember not my sins. Uh, he, he doesn't pray, Lord, remember all the good things that I've done. Re remember all the times I've been to church. Remember how I killed Goliath for you. Remember how I led your people to victory. Remember I wrote some Psalms that are in the, the Bible. No, his appeal is grounded only in who God is. Forget my sins, please, but remember your mercy. And what's so wonderful about it is that when David prays like this, he's not asking God to be something he, he doesn't want to be. He's not asking him to do something he doesn't want to do. Just be true to yourself, Lord. Do what you have promised as I trust in you. So verse 6, remember your mercy, O Lord, your steadfast love. They are from of old. They're from eternity past. There has never been a time when the Lord was not merciful and good, when he didn't abound in steadfast love. And so David can stand boldly and say, Lord, have mercy. This is the Lord who even sent his only son to die so that whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And that is why you and I can approach him just as boldly as David. It occurred to me as I was thinking how terrible it would be 
if verse 6 didn't happen. If God chose to remember our sins rather than to forget them. So that when we stand before him on judgment day, his first line is not welcome, but there are some things that we need to discuss. And then he could flick out his database of sin and open it up and your profile would be there with the time stamped entry of every time in thought, word or deed, through negligence, through weakness, through your own deliberate fault, you've done something you know you shouldn't have done or you've failed to do something good that you should have done. How terrible it would be if he chose to remember your sins. When Isaiah got a little glimpse of the glory of God, he cried, woe is me. Peter cried, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. There would be nothing worse than standing there if the Lord wanted to remember your sins. But in the Lord Jesus, he's done everything that is necessary for you to be washed completely clean. He's removed them from you as far as the east is from the west if you've trusted in Jesus. He's chosen to bury them in the bottom of the sea. He's promised that he'll put them behind his back and remember them no more. That is our gracious, gracious Lord. Makes you want to sing, doesn't it? How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And then David runs the same argument again in verses 10 and 11 as you glance down. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. It is a rerun. There's loads of Exodus language here again. Steadfast love, faithfulness, covenant, God's name. He's saying this is who you've revealed yourself to be. So for the sake of your own honor, and reputation so that the world sees you for who you are please pardon my guilt and the all at the start of verse 10 is special god will certainly hear david's prayer because all of his paths are faithfulness and love that's the source of our confidence we approach we could only ever approach god humbly because our guilt is great but we can do so boldly because his love is greater still. Prophet Isaiah says, let the wicked forsake their way, the unrighteous one their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have compassion on them to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I wonder if you come to the Lord like that and ask him to pardon you. Today would be a terrific day to do it if you haven't yet. The Lord forgives humble sinners when we come to him and ask him to do so. O oh Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Second truth about God is that he instructs willing disciples. Uh, and that's what our first point is repeated twice in the middle chunk of the psalm. So there's a framing to it, and then it goes forgiveness instruction, forgiveness instruction and we're meant to see that God's willingness to teach his children how to live is both a, a righteous thing for God to do and a loving thing for him to do the best analogy one can think of is parenting um you, you know how sometimes you read reports in the paper of a well you you know of someone a, a young person who's ended up in trouble with the law and their life has spiraled and gone out of control and, and one of the things that, that we do is to lament that in so many of those cases, there was no one around to teach them any better. And we applaud, don't we, parents and, and carers and teachers who, who try to instill good values in the next generation because we believe that, that teaching people right from wrong is, is a good thing to do and it's a loving thing to do. And so here in verse 8, it says, good and upright is the Lord, therefore... He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. The therefore is crucial. I think we've lost sight of this as a generation, haven't we? You'll, you'll hear people say that when, uh, when God tells us how to live in the Bible, when he tells us what he wants of us, 
But that whole notion is somehow outdated and ignorant. The, the line will go something like, well, times have changed, and God, as he was writing the Bible, does, he doesn't really understand anymore the sort of life that will allow a human being to flourish. So we've got to ignore what he's saying. Or that he's being controlling and oppressive, as though he's just trying to squash and limit our freedom. And humans will only flourish when we break free of his shackles his divine tyranny and choose our own path instead. But the opposite is true. When God instructs us, when he tells us how we should understand the world around us, when he tells us what we should believe, when he tells us how we should live as individuals in community, he, he does it because he loves us and because he knows what is good for us. And I hope that underlying conviction will, will shape the way that we respond to his word. It's a, it's a dangerous place if I respond to what God teaches with, with cynicism and distrust, as though we have a right to stand in judgment over it and pick and choose the things that, that we want to hear. If this is true, if God teaches us because he loves us, then I'll want to sit humbly underneath his word because he is a perfect father. And he teaches godliness to ungodly people like us to guard us from walking in paths of sin that will harm us and others, to lead us in ways that are right and will bless us. And glance on to verse 12, you'll see it again. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Well, that's the one that he will instruct in the way he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being. His offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. And the fearing that the Lord is just the parallel of humility in verse 9. It's not quaking terror. It's the, the recognition of my limitations, the acknowledgement of God's greatness and his goodness. Because the, the proud are never going to ask God for forgiveness. And the proud will never think that they need God's instruction. We'll be too busy thinking that we're fine on our own. The proverb says there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. So again, I hope we want to celebrate this morning that the Lord is good and upright. And that when we turn to him and admit our need, he, he first forgives our sins and then teaches us the way that we should go because he wants to bless us. Do you see the way it's worded in verse 13? This one who comes to the Lord in humility to obey his word, we're told their soul shall abide in well-being. We're told they shall inherit the land. They'll enjoy friendship with the Lord. So first we receive forgiveness from the Lord and then we're able to walk in friendship with the Lord in this life. As we walk with him, ultimately in the next, we inherit the land of the new creation. That's how that would be fulfilled in our case. We'll abide with him in glory forevermore. Doesn't it make you want to stop and at least smile a little bit to think that if I've trusted in the Lord Jesus, I am a friend of God. I've been reflecting on this a bit. I'll, I'll put it as a question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts a bit later. Do you think sometimes you see we stop at getting, we, we get excited about receiving forgiveness from the Lord, but we fail then sometimes to, to walk daily in a healthy friendship with the Lord. I, I wonder if at times I've been a bit too transactional in my own faith, if I can put it like that. So God gives me some great blessing in Christ, and I'm profoundly grateful, so I work really hard out of gratitude to him. Have I neglected friendship with the Lord? Uh, apparently, the, the Christian writer John Stott um, made it his habit when he first woke up in the morning to start his day with a prayer, um, Good morning, Lord. Thank you for loving me. What are we going to do together today? I don't know what you first do when you wake up in the morning. Um, 
I sort of groan and wonder which bits of my body are aching and whether I need to stay in bed a bit longer. Then I, I probably check my phone and I start running through a mental list of my tasks for and appointments for the day. Um, Stott's language is a bit quaint, isn't it? I'm sure it will sound like that to some. I'm sure he was far from perfect, but those who knew him would say that he lived as he began, that he walked trying to remember God's presence with him day by day, knowing that he was God's child, his friend, praying continually, walking with the Lord. I suspect I'm not the only one who can slip into being more urgent about the, the latest alert on my phone than living out of friendship with the Lord. But I want to remind us of the privilege that is ours in Christ. Because the Lord is good and upright, he's willing not just to forgive but to instruct. And as we listen and we, we do humbly what he says, so we, as we pray, so we walk in friendship with him. We can flourish. That's the life our soul will abide in well-being. That's the life he has for us. Finally, um, the Lord protects his waiting people. As we said, this middle of the psalm, forgiveness instruction, forgiveness instruction uh, around the edge is David trusting in God in the midst of his troubles. Um, you, you'll see it first in verses 1 to 5. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul in O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. It's a beautiful posture of trust. Uh, to, to lift up your soul to the Lord is to direct to him, to surrender to him. All of my devotion, all of my desire, all of my longing, all of my loyalty, my, my life, it's yours. Oh Lord, I lift it up to you. And that's where David is in this moment. He knows that the, the combination of his sins and his enemies are a threat to him. But in that moment, he says, I'm not going to turn away from the Lord. I'm going to take refuge in the Lord. I'm going to trust in him. And I'm going to wait for him all the day long. And it's there again at the end, starting in verse 15. My eyes are toward the Lord. He will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me, be gracious to me. I'm lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many of my foes, with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. Uh, you see the same trust, the same dependence. David had real life physical enemies all around him. But he knew he was God's king. His reign was secure, so he trusted and he waited. And that means as we read these psalms, and we're going to need to be aware of this this summer, there's, there's a big similarity between Jesus and David and a really big difference as well. So I, I hope we're clear that Jesus never sinned. In that respect, he and David are, are very different. But Jesus did have enemies like David did. He had those who hated him. He was lonely you think of him in gethsemane he was afflicted as he looked to the cross his heart was enlarged with troubles you remember he'd sweat uh, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground he too had to take refuge in the lord he too had to wait for him you remember on the cross luke says he prayed called out with a loud voice father into your hands i commit my spirit picture of perfect trust in the face of the greatest trial that our world has ever seen and God heard that prayer and in his resurrection he gave him victory over all of his enemies he gave him a kingdom that can never be shaken so as we close then I want us to think about the confidence that that can give to us today both the the, the big picture of the world 
and on the smaller scale as we think about the trials in our own lives. It's interesting that in verse 22 it goes corporate. David's been talking about himself, but then he, he prays about the whole nation. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. And on the grandest scale, the fact that God has heard and uh, answered the prayers of his king, ultimately of Jesus, can give his people the most profound and ultimate confidence. Because even though the, the fortunes of God's church ebb and flow from place to place and from generation to the next, the fact remains that Jesus is already enthroned <coughs> securely as God's king. He will build his church. Not even the gates of hell shall prevail against him. So whatever troubles that the church faces today, whichever enemies line up against it, in government or in the world, we can look ahead with absolute confidence to the day when we will bow before him. Every eye will see his glory. And so we can pray, Lord, help us. Redeem us. And we can wait for him all the day long. But that confidence is a very personal thing for the Christian as it was for David as well. Perhaps I can ask if you were writing an, an A to Z of your troubles, what would be in it at the moment? Is it anxiety? Do you feel broken? You may be convicted by your sin or confused by your circumstances. Are there things that make you despair? Is there a fear inside you? As you go through the alphabet, are you, are you lonely? Facing money troubles? The eternal solution to all of our troubles is found by taking refuge in our eternal Lord. Uh, our troubles don't always go away in this life. It's interesting, David's circumstances hadn't changed yet by the end of the psalm. Do you notice that? The enemies are still there at the end, just as they were at the beginning. But his perspective did. And the day is coming when every tear in your eye will be wiped away. And you will hunger and thirst and suffer no more. This will be a great thing for the children to hear as they come back in. Hello. In you come. That's great. Friends, the day is coming when every tear will be wiped away and you will hunger and you will thirst no more. And our Father in heaven has promised to guard your soul until that day. So whatever your troubles this morning, I want to encourage you to take refuge in him. I want to encourage you to trust in his forgiveness. It's complete if you do that. I want to encourage you to ask him to teach you his ways so that you walk in friendship with him. And I want to encourage you to wait on him all the day long, for he will come again. Let's pray together. Our Father, we want to thank you for these wonderful truths that you have revealed about yourself, that you forgive sinners who come to you in humility, that you instruct willing disciples, and that you protect your waiting people, and that one day you will redeem us from every trial and from every tear, and that we will be with you in your perfect new creation, knowing you fully, even as we are fully known. We want to thank you that that day is coming. And we pray that you might sustain us whatever we're going through today and whatever we go through in the future, that we might trust and walk with you and wait for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the reason that the children are coming back in is because we're going to share the Lord's Supper um, together.